Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the um, Vectorical Teleneurology Facebook um, Q&A. Um, it's a beautiful evening here in the south of England. Um, it has been so far a great success. Um, we um, see you every Thursday with our guests, with about eight to seven to eight thousand uh, of you joining us every week, either live or um, after a few days to watch it on replay. Tonight, um, like many um, over week, we have people from all over the world. I was seeing on the command, we have people from Costa Rica, South Africa, um, the US, India, and obviously Europe. Um, if you're not very familiar with the concept, every week, Simon and I, we invite um, a guest. We have um, a particular area of expertise in the field of neurology. Um, Simon asked a number of questions that we've already submitted to our guest that we think this question will be relevant to your practice. And after 20, 25 minutes of Q&A, um, we open the floor to you to ask questions directly to our guest. And um, tonight, I'm delighted to introduce our fantastic speaker, uh, Professor Claire Rusbridge. Claire um, and Simon and I, we've known each other for over 20 years already. We did our uh, residency roughly at the same time. I took over Claire's position at the RVC in 1997 when um, he was finishing. And already Claire was studying Cavalier King Charles at that time. So for the last 23 years, Claire, um, I've been dedicated a lot of uh, research time studying um, carry malformation and syringomyelia, and especially this condition in Cavalier. Claire is an eminent uh, speaker. Um, she split a time between uh, clinic and she worked at Fitzpatrick referral two days a week and the other two days teaching and doing research at the University of Syria. Claire has many accolades in the field of neurology, especially in the field of syringomyelia. She was awarded a PhD uh, by the University of Utrecht. She also had uh, the James Elliott Memorial Award by the Blue Cross um, Animal Welfare for her work in, in carry syringomyelia um, with the, the Breed Society. She also had the FECAVA Award uh, on Best Original Paper on Syringomyelia. So in terms of you know, expertise in the field of syringomyelia carry malformation, you can't do better than, you know, Claire. And that's why we wanted her to join us tonight to give her a take in the management of this sometimes complex condition. Um, I'm now going to let Simon take uh, the floor to ask a number of questions to Claire. In the meantime, you are very welcome to put your question in the comment box that you want me to ask later on. Before I do that, I just wanted also for you to give us your take or your input. Um, we've got Professor Johnny Ness that kindly offered to do the similar Q&A in three weeks. Um, Professor Ines is a very well-known orthopedic surgeon. Um, so if you have any suggestion on what kind of Q&A you want us to do with John in the field of, obviously, the over... Um, the overlap between neurology and orthopedy, we welcome any suggestion from you. So feel free to put your suggestion in the comment box. Simon, you can now uh, start your Q&A with Claire and uh, good luck with everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much and welcome to everyone uh, today and welcome Claire. Thank you very much for coming. As Laurent said, um, it's an honor to ha have you on to, to hear what what uh, you have to say and, and help our viewers with trying to understand what can be a pretty complex disease. And so, so we're going to start off with, with, with some, um, uh, some explanatory questions, I think, in terms of what we're actually dealing with here. And so question one is, what is Chiari-like malformation? Uh, thanks, you both, for inviting me. Um, I think you flatter me um, with your introduction. Um, may I have the first uh, slide, please, um, which I have a, a picture really of Chiari malformation. And I should first uh, apologize for the name. Uh, the name is something that uh, has come up as the result of a committee, a round table uh, that was organized at the Royal Veterinary College. And uh, it's, it is an eponymous term, meaning it, it comes from the person who first described it in humans, which is not really very satisfactory. And the reason why we chose it was because it, even at that time, 
we knew that it was going to be complex, that, that it couldn't be explained by just one uh, uh, abnormality such as just a cerebellar herniation. And a lot of people think that Chiari malformation is just a her herniation of the cerebellar, but it's a lot uh, more than that. And really, to understand Chiari, you have to think of it as a whole brain, whole skull disorder. And fundamentally, the, uh, the underpinning problem is the skull is too short. And we don't think as, of, of the breeds that are predisposed to Chiari, breeds like the uh, Cavalier, uh, the King Charles Spaniel, the Pomeranian, the Chihuahua, Maltese. Um, we don't really think of them as very brachycephalic breeds compared to the Pug um, or uh, the French Bulldog. But nonetheless, these dogs, um, if we can go to the next slide after that, please, Simon, um, they are very short in, in their what we call the skull base, which is the trough that the brain sits on. And you can see there's two pictures of brains there that are on the left hand side of, of the picture. And the one at the top is a normal cavalier that uh, doesn't have any signs. And the one at the bottom is, um, is a, a cavalier with Chiari malformation and uh, syringomyelia. And the main difference between them is that in the one on the bottom, the, the, the base, the, the bone that the, do, the, the uh, brain is sitting on is much shorter from nose to, to, towards the tail. Uh, and this means that there is less space for the brain. And when you have that shortening, then what happens is the, the, the body tries to compensate by making the bones on the top of the skull bigger. And so you get this sort of a, a, a doming. The other thing that happens that's really quite important is you also get a reduction in the nasal tissue. Um, and this is something that's really more recent research. Um, and that sort of reduction isn't sort of like a flattening of the face. It's really a, a reduction in the middle of the face. And, and, and really the consistent feature is that the dogs have, uh, instead of a sloping muzzle, um, they have a sharp, well-defined stop. And the other important thing is that um, the uh, back of the skull is insufficient. And so we can see um, uh, the back part of the, of the brain, which is called the cerebellum. And I, um, most of you are probably not so used to looking at, uh, at MRI, but the cerebellum is the bit that looks like the cauliflower um, at the back. And if we look at the one on the bottom, you can see that that doesn't have a round shape. It has a squashed shape, really as if I've got my finger and thumb and just gone squeeze like that. And in fact, the whole brain is squeezed together. Um, and this is what I'm trying to show in the picture on the right are really all of the different abnormalities that you get with Chiari malformation. And that picture looks very busy, but the overall point is to say that it's a, a complicated disorder and it is more than a cerebellar herniation. So starting at the front of the brain, you have flattening of the, the, the front part of the brain. Those, the, the, the forebrain is pushed so it looks flat. And the uh, uh, bit that's to do with smelling goes under the brain. Now, that's a bit weird because normally the, the, the bit to do with smelling should be directly connected with the nose, which should be in the front, but they tip under. The rest of the brain, the, the forebrain gets pushed up and back. And that compromises the space that's there for the hind brain, the back part of the brain consisting of the cerebellum and the brainstem. It's got less space and that's compounded by the fact that the bone at the back is really short and so it's pushed against that. And that uh, overall uh, means that there's less space for the brain, there's overcrowding of the brain uh, within that space. And that overcrowding obstructs the uh, cerebral spinal fluid pathways. And I'd like you to compare the two images on the left. And you may think that that was done with different imaging because you're probably looking at that and thinking, well, the one on the top looks really quite beautiful because I can see the gray brain and I can see the white, the gyra around it. It really shows up quite nicely. Whereas the one on the bottom, that's not quite as good definition was a reason for that lack of definition. The reason for the lack of definition is because the CSF spaces have been squashed away, um, that there is much less um, uh, obvious subarachnoid space 
in the uh, dog with the Chiari malformation and syringomyelia. I'd like you also to observe the subarachnoid space around the whole of the neuropancarina. Look how the cisterna magna is reduced. Um, yes, there's a syrinx uh, there. You can see that white fluid in the center of the spinal cord. But, there, but it's more than that. There is a reduction in the, in, in the cisterna magna that is not associated with the syrinx. And that's important because the cisterna magna is a buffer, a buffer for the pressure changes in the brain. Um, and also you can see that the ventricular spaces are all dilated. So the lateral ventricle is dilated. You can see the displacement of the corpus callosum, the third ventricle, all that white around the, the circle, which is the uh, uh, interthalamic adhesion. And the fourth ventricle is also dilated. That's normally a little slit. You can see what it looks like normally at the top, um, and you can see how dilated it is. And so that's what Chiari malformation is. And uh, I'm going to talk in another slide about what the differences are with, with syringomyelia. So um, I said before that we we really see different faces. What is the face of Chiari? Well, we can see the face of Chiari is the, the little ruby on the, uh, on the right there. And you can also see some terms. And I've uh, uh, been using these uh, sort of abbreviations to describe some of the clinical situations we see in the dog. So CMN is a normal uh, cavalier. And the reason why we call them CMN is that all cavaliers and uh, really most of the breeds that are predisposed have a have a very high uh, prevalence of a degree of Chiari malformation. And much like my MRI scans, it's really like shades of gray. Um, there's no black and white. There's no white. This dog doesn't have Chiari malformation and black. This dog does have Chiari malformation. It's all shades of gray. And so even very normal dogs have a degree of this change because basically if they didn't, they'd look like a different breed of, of dog. And so, but not always is it associated with problems. So we can see the, the rather handsome dog there at the side and, and, uh, and she is normal. Um, and you can see the difference in muzzle between her and the dog, which is syringomyelia severe, which means affected with syringomyelia signs or SM, uh, SMS. And I'll tell you about the other um, uh, 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 abbreviations that I use next. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? So also very important, especially in your miniature dogs, like your Chihuahuas and your uh, Pomeranians and your Maltese uh, and Affin Pinchers is these cranial cervical junction abnormalities. And it is this feature, along with the with the shortening of the skull, with the brachycephaly, which is the key factor which is associated with them developing syringomyelia. So when they have a very short skull, when they're brachycephalic, uh, um, as I showed in the previous one, then they're very predisposed to having signs associated with Chiari-like malformation, and that is pain. But when uh, to get syringomyelia, they typically have these cranial cervical junction changes as well. And that is when the cranial cervical junction is too close to the, um, uh, to the skull. And that's it, it, for a couple of reasons. The first is that uh, there is probably some developmental abnormality associated with the vertebrae. But the other reason is because the skull is so short, the supraoccipital bone, the back of the skull, normally has a rounded shape. And now it has um, a, a, a curved shape. The other important thing is that the angulation, the way that they, the cervical spine fits onto the skull is different. And the reason why it's different is the occipital condyles have, have, have developed differently. And so they have a slightly different angulation, which means that the dens tends to stick up. And in this, uh, in this uh, MRI scan, you can see of the Chihuahua, we can see the dens is actually pointing up into the uh, into the spinal cord, and in the Chihuahua that you can see um, here, it's not really apparent of how bad uh, its its compression is when you see the MRI because it kind of looks like a straight line. But when you look at the corresponding CT, can you see that its neck vertebrae 
are actually uh, more rostral, more towards the nose than the back of the skull. So the back of the skull is that white line. And if you uh, travel down from that, you see the atlas. And the atlas starts before the end of the skull has, it's more rostral to the end of the skull. So although you could look at that uh, chihuahua and you could casually say, oh, there's no cerebellar herniation there, you're not see the, seeing the entire picture. You're not seeing the fact that those cranial vertebrae are, in, uh, are, are really telescoping into the, the skull. And so in the uh, other radiographs we've got there at the side, it's really a, a more of a, a simple demonstration of how uh, close the, the cervical vertebrae, which is called um, atlantoaxial overlapping in some instances, um, the, you can see how close they are to the skull, but we, they don't always overlap. And that is because the occipital bone can be, uh, can be missing as it is in that chihuahua because of the high pressure, um, the, the lower part of the supraoccipital bone is gone. Wow, well, that's an excellent start to, to um, give us that very detailed overview of what Chiari-like malformation is. Um, and I would seem, it would seem like the next best place for us to go with this is talk about syringomyelia and, and if you can maybe then outline what, what is the cause of syringomyelia and how it's related to what you've just talked about. Okay, may I have the next slide, please? So in Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, you get syringomyelia with uh, two circumstances. The most common is you have the brachycephalic changes, the short cranium, uh, the cranial facial uh, hyperplasia, and the short occipital bone, plus you have the craniocervical junction abnormalities. So that's those two together, that nasty cocktail uh, results in obstruction of the CSF pathways. Um, the other possibility is they're not all the same, and this is where the shades of grey come in, is sometimes you can ha just have extreme brachycephaly, so extreme shortening of the uh, uh, cranial facial, cranium, and the olfactory area, and they can have a relatively unobstructed uh, craniocervical junction. As far as the pathogenesis of syringomyelia goes, it's, it's not really clear. There's many, many different theories. Uh, and I'm not sure whether this one is correct, but it is the one that is the most accepted. So that says that basically you have an obstruction to the subarachnoid space. So syringomyelia can occur whenever there is an obstruction to the subarachnoid space, to the CSF flow. And this was, means that there is a, a, an asynchronous movement of fluid uh, so that the arterial pulse pressure is coming at a different time to the CSF pulse pressure wave. And that's important because when they hit at the same time, the pressure is, is similar throughout. But if the CSF pressure, pulse pressure comes slightly behind the arterial pulse pressure, then it means that it may be hitting that space when the arterial pulse pressure is low. And when that is the case, the, the perivascular space, the, peri, uh, the, the so-called virtual robin space, um, becomes more open and low pressure. And so it can literally suck in that CSF fluid uh, into that space, and then it will make its way down to the central canal. And typically, the first change you get with syringomyelia is central canal dilatation. And, we'll, and it will make its way into the parenchyma of the spinal cord, which we, is, it looks like edema. We call it pre-syrinx or pre-syringomyelia. And then eventually it will coalesce to form uh, syringomyelia. And that, in, a, in essence, is the most accepted theory of, of how it's formed. Excellent. Well, now, now I guess people are going to want to know. Well, what are we, what are we going to look for in terms of clinical signs? So first, let's deal with with Chiari malformation. What, what are the clinical signs of that, and and how do you diagnose? Okay, uh, may I have the next slide, please? So this has been a, a little bit of a change uh, recently. Um, at least my thinking of it has changed, uh, and it's really from listening to the clients because. We were seeing an awful lot of dogs who had pain, but they didn't have syringomyelia. Uh, and this is what we call CMP or uh, Chiari malformation associated pain. And um, it became rather confusing because you'd also see some dogs with syringomyelia, 
who didn't have any clinical signs, so-called uh, syringomyelia mild, or SMM. Um, and um, it, I, I decided I would look at my cases um, and it was actually sort of 250 to begin with, but with all the exclusion uh, uh, criteria, it went down to 130 and decided to try and uh, correlate the clinical signs to the size of the syrinx. Uh, and this was quite surprising because it found that really a, uh, the signs of pain were the same in dogs with Chiari malformation associated pain and also syringomyelia, suggesting actually it wasn't the syrinx, but the Chiari malformation. And so the very most common sign would be vocalization. And that's not uh, you know, screaming all the time. That's really related to posture. Um, uh, as particularly, and sort of the classic one, well, as owners will report that when they pick the dog up, typically underneath the shoulders, uh, underneath the, in the armpits, a bit like a sack of potatoes, I suppose, the dog will give a yelp. And that the dog will also yelp when suddenly changing position, especially when they're lying on, on the ground. So they may yelp during the night. I mean, when I say yelp, I mean really yelp. Um, and it's difficult, or it's very dangerous actually to, to anthropomorphize, but um, I've, I've been quite lucky in that I've uh, been able to attend meetings with uh, humans who have Chiari malformation, and I ask them what they feel, what their pain is like. And humans with this also describe a, a pounding headache when they sort of first stand up, so that they just want to drop to the ground. And it's thought to be this uh, microgravitational effects on fluid. Also, when you're lying down overnight, fluid does tend to collect in your brain. You tend to have a slightly fuller brain uh, full of fluid. And so that's why it's more apparent at night. And so the most common sign is that, that the dogs tend to, to yelp. And that may be all it is, um, a, an occasional yelp, an occasional headache. But it can get much worse. The other su surprising sign is that even without a syrinx, they can have spinal pain. And that spinal pain can be anywhere in the spine, uh, more commonly in the neck. And unlike disc disease, where if you would have a dog with disc disease, you'd literally be able to go down each vertebrae and press on um, uh, on the actual disc and you'd find it was really quite localized. In this, it's more of a general hyperesthesia. So you sort of put your hands on the neck and, and the dog sort of scrunches up or you put your hands on the thoracolumbar region and they scrunch up. And sometimes it can be even lumbar sacral. And I say they don't, that does, isn't corresponding to there being a syrinx under there, which was really a surprise to me. I only really found that out when I was doing a blinded study, which actually didn't get uh, published uh, low power. Um, but um, in that blinded study where I didn't know what was wrong with the dogs, I was um, recording the signs and was quite surprised to keep, keep on finding the spinal pain. The other thing is they have exercise intolerance, reduced activity. And this is because when the heart rate goes up, that there is some transfer of that pressure to the brain is usually compensated for but when you have chiari that compensation mechanism is, is 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 very poor and so often the owners will describe that they're less likely to run and play we think that they scratch and rub their heads because they have um, a headache and that's the uh, another common sign but um, it's not just generalized scratching and that's a that's a very important take-home point that if the dog is scratching at their belly on nibbling their feet, then that is not a sign associated with Chiari or syringomyelia. That is a sign associated with skin disease, and that's what the dog should have a trial treatment for first before having an expensive MRI scan. Um, so they, and when I say scratch and rub at the back of the heads, all dogs scratch and rub their back of their heads, um, but this is excessive or with vocalization. Anything that changes posture, like jumping or doing stairs, a lot of people notice there's a behavioral change. The dog may become more anxious, withdrawn, perhaps more belligerent to other dogs. Uh, and they may be averse to being touched, especially around their head and neck. And a really surprising sign was a lot of them have disrupted sleep. Now, it, it shouldn't be dis, dis, a surprising sign because, of course, pain disrupts your sleep. But I just didn't realize how many it was, one in five. So, excellent. Okay. So, how how do those signs um, differ from those dogs with syringomyelia? I mean, you, you've you've kind of said that a lot of that then is is due to Chiari and some of what some of those we believed were 
related to, to syringomalia. So if we just yeah. talk about syringomalia now, what are the clinical so, signs of that? So some, if you could go to my next slide. So I should say that my study that I did had a lot of problems. And the biggest problem was it was completely retrospective and it was down to the history that I took. And one thing that I think really needs to be done, I'm hoping somebody will do it, is to do that prospectively and to quantify it in some way. Because my feeling is that all of these signs of pain, although it wasn't different between um, uh, dogs with syringomyelia and dogs with Chiari malformation, that some dogs with severe syringomyelia have that pain a lot worse or a lot more persistent. But the surprise was that we didn't find any signs of uh, uh, additional clinical signs until the syrinx became quite wide. Uh, and I have a picture there what I mean by a wide syrinx, because sometimes it's not always obvious. I don't mean a long syrinx. I don't mean a syrinx going right the way down the spinal cord. I mean a syrinx that if you were to chop the spinal cord like a cucumber and look at the, the inside part, that you'd see there was a big hole in the middle. And we didn't find any signs until the syrinx became four millimeters wide or greater. Bear in mind, this was all cavaliers. So I don't have any data for how big it has to be in the chihuahua. And uh, there, that is when you can get the very classic sign, which is phantom scratching. And that only occurs when you have a big syrinx. So big syrinx um, that is in that mid cervical area. So I'm, I've marked the area there, but with the yellow lines. Um, with the syrinx with a, a, a red star. And that is seems to be associated with disruption to the superficial dorsal horn. And in all of the dogs, you can see extension of the syrinx to that dorsal horn region. And if you're thinking, I oh, can't remember my anatomy, I'm going to show you a picture of that in another slide, but not just yet, Simon. Um, so that the, the phantom scratching is very much associated with that. So if you are seeing a dog that is scratching and it doesn't have a syrinx like that, you really need to investigate other causes of scratching because um, I've looked at a lot of dogs and this is really very, very consistent. And if I don't see that, then I'll be wanting to at least put the dog on a trial of other, other treatment. The other thing they can get is, uh, is scoliosis or cervical torticollis, and that is also associated with a wide syrinx. And um, they can have weakness, as you might expect, if they have destruction of their central spinal cord. Um, and because it's gray matter, they're much more likely to have weakness of their thoracic limbs and their, and their back than they are of their pelvic limbs. And they may have sensory signs, uh, proprioceptive deficits, again, worse in the thoracic limbs than the, than the um, uh, pelvic limbs. May I have the next slide? So this is this for, for those that are feeling a bit shaky on the old anatomy. The superficial dorsal horn is where that little arrow is, um, uh, the red. And so the syrinx has got to go right to the edge of the spinal cord. And you can see the difference um, with the arrow pointing to the one with the phantom scratcher. You can see that like a slash. Um, and uh, the reason I think, and this is my hypothesis, still really has to be um, uh, uh, proven, is that that damage results in the hyperactive scratching reflex. So you can induce this phantom scratching, you can induce it, and I, I will to prove it, to rub that area of skin that's associated with that spinal cord segment, and you should be able to induce it in that contralateral leg. Uh, my theory is there is a, a proprio-spinal, not proprioceptive, proprio-spinal connection between that superficial dorsal horn and the central pattern generator for scratching in the lumbar sacral region and somehow damaging those, um, that taking out that area of the superficial dorsal horn disrupts that so that you have a hyperactive reflex. And the reason why I have that hypothesis really is not because I'm super, super clever, but because I've read the work of Sherrington, as in Schiff Sherrington. And Sherrington um, basically uh, did some rather nasty experiments in dogs where he severed the spinal cord. Uh, we all know about Schiff Sherrington, which is the, what happens. But what, what most people don't know is that he kept those dogs alive. And about three months later, despite the fact the dogs were paralyzed, they developed this scratching reflex. May I have the next slide, please? So this is the scoliosis. 
And uh, a rookie mistake is to only look at the front of the dog and see a head tilt. Um, and that is very easy to do. So you really have to look from the top. Um, and this is thought to be because of a sensory deficit, a, a deficit in proprioception of the neck. Um, so not knowing where the neck is in space. And, um, and basically the, the head is down the opposite side to the dorsal horn involvement and the shoulder is pushed out the same side as the dorsal horn in, uh, involvement. Uh, the interesting thing is that despite um, uh, the fact the syrinx doesn't improve, the scoliosis often does. Uh, I always think it's a bit like vestibular disease, that the animal learns to compensate for the deficit and, and, and put their head upright again. Right. Uh, um, I guess what's, what's also important is for us to discuss, and this is our next question, then, what neurological signs are not associated with Chiari and Stringomyelia? Well, I think this is a very important, uh, important question. And, and can I have the next slide? Because um, people are quite aware of this condition. And let's face it, it's got a, a, a really complicated name. I mean, Syringomy what? Um, uh, and uh, it, uh, it's sort of neurological, which people aren't uh, necessarily so familiar with. And so they tend to attribute many neurological diseases to this syndrome. And actually, it's understanding because many of the neurological syndromes they attribute to this disease have actually got no MRI changes. So what I'm thinking about is things like idiopathic epilepsy, fly-catching syndrome, idiopathic facial nerve paralysis, idiopathic vestibular syndrome. And so when the, uh, the clinician does the MRI and they see a hooching great big uh, syringomyelia there, it's very tempting to think that, that that may be the explanation for, say, the dog's um, uh, facial nerve paralysis. But you have to remember that the syrinx is damaged the spinal cord, don't lose all your neurology, the syrinx should have signs that correspond to its neurolocalization. So if you have a large syrinx in the C6 to T2 region, you'd expect that to have damaged the, the cervical gray matter, and that could be associated with thoracic weakness. It's not going to cause seizures because seizures are a forebrain disease. And although a lot of, um, uh, of cavaliers are epileptic, there has been no connection made between Chiari malformation and, and epilepsy. And the other one that, um, the reason for putting the picture of there, um, which I've borrowed of the uh, cavalier in the cart, is because one of the most common diseases I see people being confused with is degenerative myelopathy, because people think degenerative myelopathy is something of German shepherds and other large breed dogs. But there are many breeds that get degenerative myelopathy associated with the SOD1 mutation, and the cavalier is very much one of them. And so what you don't see with syringomyelia is progressive paralysis of the back legs. Um, it, it, um, uh, these dogs keep walking. Um, uh, they um, uh, can be extremely tetraparetic but they usually keep, uh, um, uh, keep on walking, even if they stumble a lot. So if you're seeing progressive paralysis or a dog that's off its back legs, then it's likely something else and it's likely something more caudal to the neck. So you need to be imaging, looking for degenerative myelo um, intervertebral disc disease rather, and perhaps consider genetic testing uh, for the SOD1 mutation. Great, important stuff uh, there for people to know for sure. and and. I probably your, your most commonly asked question, this is the, the final one that I have for you, um, is how do you treat all of this? So uh, I think the simple answer to that is probably not so well. But saying that, the, the many dogs do very well for, for, for years. Um, and I've done this little sort of flow chart here because I think it's important to consider the clinical signs as to what you are actually treating. Uh, because um, one thing that uh, I, I think is quite common is people associate giving gabapentin with this disease. And so they see the uh, syrinx, syrinx there and think, ah, oh, I shall give gabapentin for this as if it's some sort of nerve tonic. Um, but it's not. Gabapentin is very much indicated for neuropathic pain. Um, uh, it's only neuroprotective in a very vague sense and not, not proven sense. So there's no point in giving it 
unless the animal is actually in pain. There's also good evidence that um, it will, uh, along with the other gabapentinoids, be effective for phantom scratching. And that's really because uh, glutamate, which is the neurotransmitter of pain, is also the neurotransmitter in the dorsal horn associated with um, uh, transmission of itch impulses. So they work for, for both of it. So I think the first thing is to decide actually what you're trying to treat. And I've divided them into three things. The first is pain or CMP. The next is uh, SM associated phantom scratching. And the next is gait abnormalities, so weakness and postural deficits. And I'll start with those and I'd say that is by far the most difficult to treat, uh, those weak weakness. Um, and weakness seems to be much more common in the very miniature breeds like Chihuahuas, Yorkshire Terriers, Maltese, and they, and they get um, the phantom scratching less commonly. And that's, that's all down to neurolocalization. They're much more likely to have a cervical thoracic syrinx that's big, much less likely to have a mid cervical uh, syrinx, uh, which is associated with the phantom scratching. So with those dogs, actually, quite surprisingly, um, the best treatment is, is physi physiotherapy and hydrotherapy, um, but uh, uh, to really to maximize what they've got. And it's actually surprising how, how they, can, they can do. The only other option for those dogs is surgical management. I'm not really going into surgery much. Um, uh, I don't even think I put a slide in here for that. I think the problem with, um, with the surgeries is they're quite good for pain but they're not good for getting rid of the syrinx unless you can put a shunt in in some way. But shunts are very, very prone to problems and, and blockages. Um, and so um, uh, surgical management is not uh, always such a great uh, option, especially for these weak dogs, because what you need is something that is that is um, is going to cause that syrinx to collapse. The other problem is the weakness is due to already damaged gray matter, and that isn't going to repair. And so even if you do really successful surgery, it's not necessarily going to come back. We can sometimes use uh, CSF reducing drugs like cimetidine, omeprazole, and acetazolamide. Um, the problem with acetazolamide is it's, it's not very nice given in the long term, can be associated with side effects. The trouble with the omeprazole and uh, uh, cimetidine is it's a bit unproven. Um, it's very anecdotal. And though some people have reported that uh, it can help with pain, I've actually done MRIs on dogs uh, before and after cimetidine and omeprazole and not seen any difference in the syrinx. So I, I, um, I guess try it if it's, if it's possible. So those are the weakness. That's the most difficult. Pain is probably the most uh, easy, um, but still um, uh, only easy to begin with. Um, so uh, I, I will start with licensed drugs just because uh, in Britain, uh, Cascade uh, really says that we should. Um, but if that is not working, then I'll switch or add pretty quickly to gabapentinoids. Uh, and I start with gabapentin because it's cheaper. Uh, and more generally available. And what that does is it, it, re, re, it reduces the neurotransmitter of pain, glutamate. If that continues, then I swap, I, I straight swap, I don't wean off and wean on, uh, to pregabalin. And that's because pregabalin binds to that receptor for longer and with more affinity. Um, and um, uh, if people are wondering about the doses, I do have a slide with all the doses written down with it, but you can basically get away with half of uh, uh, of the dose of gabapentin compared to, to gabapentin. So 100 mg of, of gabapentin equals 50 mg of, of pregabalin. And that seems to be much more effective. After that, you're into um, uh, uh, other uh, polypharmacy. Um, uh, but also consider surgery because actually the, your standard surgeries, your frame and magnum decompression is, uh, I think, indicated if you are not getting a good response to medical management uh, because the chance of getting a good response with other drugs is, is less. And really, the story of phantom scratching is a little bit the same because, as I said before, the gabapentinoids make the difference, but I won't bother trying any other drug with those first. Uh, and uh, I would say if any of you have those um, dogs and they're not responding to those, then we are actually doing a treatment trial for a novel therapy at Fitzpatrick's. 
um, and um, and so you could refer those cases to me if they have an MRI diagnosis. And I'm I'm not going to tell you what the name of the drug is. I'm afraid. Um, so you'll notice in all of that, that I don't mention corticosteroids. And I can actually count on the, the fingers of one hand, even less than that, the number of dogs that I have currently out of the hundreds that I treat um, on corticosteroids. I very rarely, if ever, use them. So um, they're definitely not your reach for drug. Yeah, they probably work. But are you really seriously going to put a two year old dog on corticosteroids for the rest of their life? I've seen people do it. I think they hope they die in about six months or something or think that they're not going to live. That's being rather cynical. But if you do put them on, then um, they were going to get more side effects from, from the dr those drugs than you are going to get in, in treatment resolution. So they really are considered a, a very much last resort that I very, very rarely ever have to resort to. I wonder, can I have the next slide? So this somewhat messy uh, uh, slide is really what to do next. Um, and uh, this is when I start to get into, into, into problems myself. Uh, first of all, I have, to, I have to thank Charlie's owner, who may even be watching um, for the picture of her dog there. She posted that on um, uh, um, Facebook. And Charlie's very pretty dog, and I was just struck uh, by that picture. Um, which she put the caption something along the lines of, do you think Charlie's got a headache? Uh, and many of these dogs will have times that they will uh, be worse. And it's not, it's not necessarily a 24-7 pain. And so you, so you should always write as veterinary surgeons a plan for top-up pain relief. And actually, I will quite commonly use paracetamol for that. And the reason for that is that people can get hold of it fairly easily. A late night chemist, apart from now, during the COVID-19, you can't get hold of it. But normally, uh, you, a late night chemist will... will um, uh, stock paracetamol, and that can be quite useful when dosed uh, appropriately. Um, and um, so, uh, and the, there is speculation, uh, well, actually, fairly uh, some evidence, shall we say, a trend towards, I think, was the words the statistician used that showed that when the the, the uh, uh, pressure, as demonstrated by the the, the cartoon that I borrowed from Cavalier Matters there, when the pressure rapidly changes, especially when it drops, that they're more likely to have pain. So um, I will also use complementary therapy if I can. Acupuncture can work for some dogs. CBD oil, I include that because there's always a question about it. I think it can probably work. Um, there's every evidence too. And actually, it's one of my sort of bugbears about treating in inverted commas, neuropathic pain. It's like treating epilepsy. We only treat the neurons, but actually uh, in epilepsy and neuropathic pain, there is more to it than just neurons. There are astrocytes as well, and they are maintaining that pain state. And the astrocytes have cannabinoid receptors. So there's a lot in there. Um, but on the other hand, the evidence suggests that the dose rate, 2.5 milligrams per kilogram twice daily, is um is hard to achieve especially when your formulation only has 65 milligrams in a bottle so it's uh, it that one's difficult so my most common ones that i'll add are to pyramate um which as many of you know has a carbonic anhydrase um uh, action so quite similar to acetazolamide so it's quite attractive actually as potentially a drug to reduce uh, CSF pressure, although we haven't seen any remarkable results with it. Um, and actually, our, the trial that was done in conjunction with the Royal Veterinary College found that it was not quite as good as pregabalin. Um, I'll add a low dose of uh, um, uh, amitriptyline. And sometimes I will use a mantidine or mamantine. Um, uh, teen. Uh, I think I've spelt that wrong. Um, uh, uh, just the trouble with adding all of these medications is that you get increasing um, side effects. And I'm just going to, if we can go forward to the last slide for all those that are desperately saying, but what's the dose rate? What's the dose rate? Those are the dose rates that I use. These are, these are, um, these are, um, I put the cat in there, uh, mainly because cats uh, can get Chiari malformation. 
Um, but they don't tend to get syringomyelia. And I think that is because they don't have the craniocervical junction abnormalities. And of course, the cats that get Chiari malformation is the Persian. Anything with a flat face uh, is much more predisposed. Great. Sure. Fantastic over overview, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand you back to Laron, uh, who's got some questions from the audience, uh, which he'll hopefully be able to go through with you after drinking what it looks like two pints of gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> I had, a bad, day with, uh, had a, a very bad day with homeschooling, trying to juggle homeschooling and reporting MRI. I have to say, so I well deserve the gin and tonic. Um, <laughs> this slide, I think, summarizes um, how important it is to interact with all, um, you know, a number of bodies and especially um, all the breed club. And I think um, um, Claire has shown you that a lot of the studies she done was on MRI, but a lot of them has been based on interaction with pet owner and without that and especially without the interaction with all the breed club and especially you can see a number of cavalier club all this study will not be you know um we won't be able to do them and what claire has, has done very well is to to listen you know to the owner it's very easy to dismiss all the little signs that they, they, they report but when you keep hearing the same sign especially in a given breed um i think it's important to give more you know, to always give credence to what the owner are telling you. The other thing I wanted to share with you, um, if you're not familiar with it yet, Claire has a fantastic webpage um, called veterinary-neurologist.co.uk, uh, um, especially if you are a pet owner uh, or if you have pet owner with carry malformation, there's a number of uh, frequently asked questions. So it's always good to have some, you know, good resource um, on the web, it's very easy to, to get lost, you know, when you start uh, Googling a number of, you know, conditions like carry malformation or syringomyelia. I would highly recommend you guide your client, you know, to this webpage to find all these frequently asked questions. Now I'm going to ask a question from, uh, that you have submitted over the last uh, 45 minutes. Um, there is, you know, a number of questions that I've seen Claire have already uh, answered. One of them is from another fellow neurologist, Sophia uh, Batty. Um, would you advise collecting CSF in dog with carry malformation, uh, especially if you suggest meningual encephalitis of unknown etiology? And if so, do you go with a lumbar puncture? Hi, Sophie. Um, so, um, yes, is the answer. I think it is. Uh... Um, mening uh, MUO or meningoencephalomyelitis of unknown origin is that is one of the major differentials if you have um, a presyrinx, which is edema within the spinal cord. So the first thing I would say with that presyrinx is um, make sure you also do contrast enhancement, uh, image the brain, um, and also uh, image in T1 um, because a syrinx. Uh, will uh, obviously have a low signal on on uh, on T1. Also, the pattern of distribution is different in in uh, pre syrinx. It tends to be in the centre of the spinal cord and sort of going up uh, into the dorsal columns. Um, whereas in MUO, um, it, it tends to be more patchy through the spinal cord. But the general answer is yes, um, and I I tend to take a lumbar puncture. Um, as Laurent uh, inferred, I'm incredibly old, and um, and I was doing first seeing Cavaliers with Chiari malformation when we were still doing myelograms, which is really as as my daughter says in, in the olden days, um, and we were merrily uh, taking cisternal punctures and putting in contrast around these the, these Cavaliers. But now, when I think about it, I I think, gosh, that was a small space to try to hit, and so I do tend to use a lumbar puncture. However, a word of warning, um, the CSF is usually abnormal, uh, especially with a high protein. And that's due to the um, um, uh, sort of like a, a lack of, flu of, of flowing fluid. So it tends to get stagnant um, because it's not flowing very much. Then the, uh, the protein comes out of, uh, of the blood vessels uh, and you get a higher protein. And you also quite commonly get a raised white blood cell count, not in the hundreds, but certainly in the tens. Um, and so you have to be careful with interpretation that you're not overreading it. Very good. Um, another very interesting question. 
from a, a, a colleague neurologist in the US, Fred, um, we form a magnum decompression prognosis. Um, is it associated with when you do surgery? I think that's the million dollar question. Are we treating this case too late um, to actually hope for a positive outcome compared to human where we tend to treat them much sooner? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Fred. I think it's difficult to answer. Um, th there was some speculation that uh, if you leave it um, too long, then the syrinx won't reverse. And certainly that that can be true. The syrinx um, uh, reaches this kind of dynamic equilibrium. Um, uh, and I'm sure many neurologists here will have noticed that if they MRI, do serial MRIs of dogs, um, after a certain time point, the syrinx stays incredibly unchanged um, from, uh, from uh, year to year. Um, so the, there is an argument for perhaps doing some sort of corrective surgery before the syrinx develops, but that won't necessarily, um, uh, necessarily stop the syrinx developing in, in my experience. Um, and um, there is very poor evidence, I think, that um, that um, that if you that doing uh, surgery earlier uh, is likely to uh, um, mean that the syrinx won't progress as, as quickly, because the, the the MRIs that I have sh uh, done suggests that the syrinx can actually develop extremely quickly in a dog's life, so within weeks or even days. I'm sure you've all had cases of the neurologists out there of uh, hydrocephalus where the dog didn't have a syrinx um I, i'm talking about obstruction um uh, um uh, hydrocephalus that has stringomyelia as well where the dog has gone from being completely normal to having a massive syrinx within days and it's also possible to reverse that syrinx uh, by putting a shunt um within days as well um and so I'm, I don't think that there's necessarily any rush for surgery, but maybe that's because I'm quite conservative and I also don't like owners to be too disappointed. Um, and so I tend to do surgery when I've shown that medical management is not making enough difference. Very good. Another question from a, a resident in training, um, Cohen, that has been following us um, for quite a while and I think he's going to be a great neurologist, dear Claire. Do you often see or look for um, syringo bulbia? If you can maybe explain to everyone what syringo bulbia is. Yes, um, great question. So syringo bulbia is a, an expansion of the syrinx into the brain stem. It's usually only a, a slit. Um, and um, uh, that actually is much less common um, in dogs than it is in, uh, in uh, humans. Um, so the... Uh, certainly, with, with screening protocols, um, uh, do you mean the um, the screening protocols that are used for breeding uh, dogs? Acquisimities, yeah. Yes, well, that would be recorded um, if they had syringobulbia as well, because. Um, uh, but really, it's it's often very subtle, and and there has been an, a nice paper on on syringobulbia as well. Absolutely. The last question to close this uh, evening. Um, if you do, I think it's quite a relevant question. A lot of people um, have access to CT, but maybe not MRI. If you diagnose on CT, um, you know, syringomyelia and carry malformation, do you actually need to do an MRI or is it enough? Um, it is a good question. Um, and actually, there is a lot of to be said for CT. Um, and if I had my way uh, if there was an infinite amount of money um, then we would do CT as well um, and the reason for that is that uh, the, bo the abnormality is a bony one and um, I think that it would be much easier to screen dogs should we be able to get to a point of screening uh, dogs uh, accurately um, uh, for Chiari malformation I think it'll be a lot easier to do that with CT because it's cheaper more available and can be done with sedation. And I'm quite lucky that uh, Cavalier Matters, which is one of the charities I've mentioned and you showed, is actually um, uh, been uh, funding a research study looking into that, basically paying for the CTs to occur. And we're looking at uh, creating 
doing machine learning, so putting um, people who are actually clever with computers are uh, not like me, um, uh, doing all sorts of algorithms to try to predict which dogs will get syringomyelium. So um, the, the very, very long answer is maybe we'll have a method of using CT in the future, which will be predictive of whether a dog is at risk for pain or syrinx. Uh, another answer to your question is that CT, you can pretty reliably see the uh, cerebellar herniation. You can see the bony changes. Um, so you can diagnose a, a, a Chiari malformation, but it's much more difficult to see the syrinx. However, if you can see the syrinx on the CT, it's definitely there and it's definitely probably quite big. And so, yes, I would argue that if you have appropriate signs and a big syrinx that you can see on CT, then no, it's not necessary to do, a, to do an MRI. I may have a, a last question. It's more for me. If you see what we call a pre-syrinx state um, on MRI, what is the meaning in terms of uh, the relevance for the clinical sign? Yeah, that's another good question. Uh, so the pre-syrinx is the edema that you get in the spinal cord that is um, uh, before it develops into a syrinx. And in many, if you're, if you, basically if you're uh, um, scanning the dog when it's very young, so like one year of age, then it's worth following that dog up because that dog may be in the transition uh, uh, process for developing syringomyelia. So as I've alluded to before, it prob so the syrinx probably develops uh, when the dog is very young. So if we to take the cavalier population that we looked at for screening, um, about 25% of them had syringomyelia. And that ro rose up to, uh, sorry, 25% of them had syringomyelia when they were one. And that rose up to 60% when they were three. So it's really that between that period, those first three to four years, when they rapidly developed the syrinx. So um, it, when you, if you um, see pre-syrinx in a younger dog, then that may be in a state of change. But you do also see some dogs with pre-syrinx that remains unchanged throughout their lives. Clinically, it probably um, doesn't result in uh, neurological signs, but that's very difficult to, to say. I mean, if you have edema all around those nerve cells, you think it would affect something in some way. Uh, uh, but more commonly, the dogs are presenting with signs of pain associated with the Chiari malformation. Um, and the other interesting thing is sometimes if they have, well, I think it's interesting, but then I'm very interested by syringomyelia all the time. But if you have a dog that um, didn't have a, a syrinx, but then has some other pathology occur, so example, a, an arachnoid adhesion or an intervertebral disc, then you may see a pre-syrinx that's slightly cranial to to that pathology because that has just tipped it over the edge. That little impingement on the subarachnoid spade, uh, space has just tipped it over into, into pre-syrinx. And then if you deal with that obstruction, then I presume, I can't really back that up with a lot of, uh, of MRIs, uh, that that pre-syrinx will disappear. Very good. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I think you can see from you know, your enthusiasm um, how much you know, you, you've put how much effort you've put in, in learning and, and also studying this cavalier with syringomyelia and carry malformation. I think it's a good lesson as well for the resident and young neurologist. Um, but, you know, doing the exam is one thing. But after that, you really need to see, to find something, a niche that you really want to investigate. And, and that's what keeps you, you know, going more than, you know, doing the routine clinic and, that's what you've done over the last 20 years with the syringomyelia and, you know, your enthusiasm is obvious tonight, you know, uh, answering all these questions. Um, if you want to join me to give a round of virtual applause to Claire for giving a time tonight to answer uh, all these questions. I wanted as well to let you know what we've got in store um, for the next few weeks. Next week, we've got a, a fascinating talk. Um, I think a lot of you probably had question from Petoner about the use of cannabinoid oil in epilepsy. And we've got uh, Dr. Lisa Bartner from Colorado State University um, that will answer um, our question. Um, the following week, we've got uh, Dr. Colin Driver, 
um, from Lumbry Park uh, referral in the south of England will talk to us about how do I manage thoracolumbar myelopathies in pug dog. That leaves me to thanks again, Claire, for giving a thank uh, you. Evening. Um, it's yes, time thanks, to actually Claire. give a round of applause act, uh, for all the carers I can hear on the street outside, everyone coming out. <laughs> I can hear on the street outside. But where are yeah, well, my kids clapping me? And I realize it's not but, for me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so just imagine they're all clapping for you as well. But thank you very much, everyone. And have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Yep, thanks, Claire. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.